Good morning, everybody. I am Rafael Ortega, Ramsey County Commissioner. And I will go around the room, uh, first the table, and then all our guests and visitors. Mike? All right. Mike Rogers, Ramsey <laughs> County. Sorry, Joe's council member for Ward 3 in St. Paul. So I've joined with uh, Minda at the district. Amanda Tewer with the St. Paul area payment. You want to start back there? Jessica Lobbs, uh, project manager, EPE team. Christina Slattery, cultural resources consultant with Meet and Hunt for the county. Brian Bauman uh, with the project management consultant team with HGR. Jason Gottfried, project management team, HNTB, Minneapolis. Steve Brown with the project management team, HNTB. Paul Hart, uh, chairperson of the Transportation and Land Use Committee for the Fort Road Federation. Kevin Gallatin, co-chair of the Community Advisory Committee. Amy Nicholson, Highland Park resident. Nick Thompson with Metro Transit. Brian Heath, Metro Transit Service Development. Adam Harrington, Metro Transit. Anna Potter, City of St. Paul Public Works. Bill Emery, I serve as a staff and Hennepin County Board Chair, Irene Fernando's office. Uh, Jordan Frank Shannon, owner of Van Gogh Auto and West 7th. Meg Dewar, West 7th resident and president of the Fort Road Federation. Spencer Lutke, uh, Transportation Committee member for the Macro Council. Lisa Washington, uh, project manager for Formula and working on this community engagement team. Morning, I'm Nicole Krause with Bolton & Mink. Patrick Donahue, I'm a, a broker on West 7th Street. Uh, Alan robbins Finger, Mississippi National River and Recreation Area National Park Service. Joe Gladke, Hennepin County Public Works. Jane McClure from the Villager newspaper. Oh, Jahong Han, a uh, freelance journalist. Damian Goble with the Community Reporter. Uh, Josh Olson, Ramsey County Community Economic Development. Uh, Robbie King, Metropolitan Council. Kevin Roggenbuck, Ramsey County Public Works staff. And I'm Jennifer Jordan, Ramsey County staff as well. Uh, we'll move. Well. Oh, have we missed some people? Let's let's make sure we catch folks. Jay Severance, uh, I'm with uh, Citizen Advocates for Regional Transit. I'm also a CAC member and a downtown resident. Elias Montessa, Met Council Community Relations. Christian Noyce, uh, Summit University resident, uh, Master's of Science in Environmental Policy. Janet Moore, Star Tribune. Henry McDaniels, uh, constituent of St. Paul Ward 3 and a McAllister College student. Kyle Fisher, Metropolitan Airports Commission. Sarah Flum, Minda, Metro District, Transit Section. Uh, Nakorm, Transit Director, Minda, Metro. John Perlich, St. Paul Area Chamber. Raquel Strand, Bolton and Mink. Well, are we done? Thank you all for coming. Today's agenda is all going to be information. There are no action items. So, Jennifer, I'll let you uh, take it away with the project overview. 
All right. Thank you, Commissioner. So we have a land acknowledgement. Uh, we always do this before our meetings. Uh, every community owes its existence and vitality to the generations from around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will. Some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hope of a better life. And some have lived on this land since time immemorial. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We are standing on the ancestral lands of the Dakota people. We want to acknowledge the Ojibwe, the Ho-Chunk, and the other nations of people who also called this place home. We pay respects to their elders past and present. Please take a moment to consider the treaties made by the tribal nations that entitle non-native people to live and work on traditional native lands. Consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. And please join us in uncovering such truths at any and all public events. All right, so today's agenda, we've we've went through and done uh, introductions. Uh, our focus today is to, to give you an overview of, of the project in terms of where we're at with this phase and the upcoming milestones that we're anticipating in February and beyond. Um, but we're really going to delve deep. Sorry about that. I hit that. Um, we're really going to delve deep into the two streetcar options today and the details uh, of those options so that you're clear. So with that, we'll be uh, delving into travel time, ridership, cost. Um, we'll talk about some, some key elements at Mall of America and at the Highway 5 River Crossing, mm -hmm. and then we'll really get into the details in terms of the two streetcar options and what the differences are uh, for the West 7th area. Then we'll be uh, asking for a report from our Community Advisory Committee uh, in terms of uh, the presentation that they had on Monday, and then we'll talk about next steps in terms of this phase, um, and then we'll also take public comment. So if you have public comment, uh, we ask that you fill out a, a card so that we can make sure that we can call you up to give your uh, comments. And we will ask folks to just go ahead and come up here to the, the podium. That way we can capture the comments very clearly because we are recording this to make sure that we transcribe uh, the meeting summary uh, correctly as possible. So project overview and upcoming milestones. So we've shown this uh, image before. Um, this is a three-year phase. Uh, we've taken a little bit of extra time because we've uh, had a lot of issues to work through with our partners. Um, right now, uh, we have identified two streetcar options and a bus option. Um, and what we are looking to do today is to give you that detailed information. In February, we will give you detailed information on the bus alternative. We'll give you a comparison of the bus alternative with the streetcar options, uh, and as well as uh, recommendations that are coming out of an economic impact analysis for the West 7th piece of the corridor. Um, one thing that I want to acknowledge with this project overview in terms of timing, uh, we anticipated this to be a three-year phase. We are in our fourth year, and the reason being is St. Paul, our partner, asked us to look at an additional option. And so that took a little bit more time. Um, but from that point, we want to make sure that we get it right, that we take our time. Um, and so with that said, once we complete this phase and whatever the direction of the policy advisory committee is on moving forward, if it were a streetcar, we would move to the next phase, which is a, a two-year project development phase, and then a three-year uh, engineering phase. So just to give folks kind of a sense of, of timing and what the horizon is for a project like this, but just want to acknowledge that. So I mentioned upcoming milestones. Um, at your February meeting, we're hopeful that the Policy Advisory Committee can make a decision on whether you all feel comfortable going out to the public with the options that we have before us. Um, from that point, we would go out with a robust public engagement effort. Uh, we're anticipating that to be spring and summer, and then reconvening the Policy Advisory Committee in fall for you all to make a decision on what's the next steps for this project. Is it moving forward as streetcar or is it moving forward as bus? So that's, uh, that's kind of an overview of upcoming milestones that we'll be looking at. So, 
recap of the streetcar options. We did show you these last time, but it's always good to uh, revisit things. It was last month. Um, and just to kind of give you a high level overview before we delve into the details. So streetcar option number one is an alignment that starts at Mall of America. It is interlined with Blue Line all the way up to the existing Fort Snelling station. And then at that point, it would veer off and there would be a historic Fort Snelling station for Riverview. And it would turn onto Highway 5, West 7th, and travel along West 7th to downtown St. Paul on Kellogg. This option, uh, we worked really hard on uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, and this was a mainly dedicated option from Mall of America to Grand Avenue. Um, it does have shared lanes from Grand Avenue to Union Depot and 20 stations. This option does include a new river bridge that would uh, help to fix the deficiencies for bikes and pets currently. So it would be a bridge that would accommodate transit, automobile traffic with bikes and pets above. Um, and so this was an option that we arrived at. And then um, streetcar option number two, it is very similar in the sense that it includes the elevated MOA station at 82nd, a new Highway 5 river bridge that would also accommodate bikes and pedestrians on top. Uh, the difference here is that um, based on feedback from our St. Paul partners, this would be dedicated only to uh, around auto, and then it would be shared lanes with traffic from auto all the way to Union Depot. So that is a major distinction. Another distinction that you'll learn about in a bit is that at that point, it stops being in the center of the roadway and is on the sides. So folks would access it from uh, the sidewalk. The stations would be along the sides as opposed to in the center. And along with this option, there are two additional stations, one being at Smith and Jefferson. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mona Elabadi, who will go through travel time, ridership, and costs with you all. Um, Mona, take it away. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Mona Elabadi with SRF Consulting, and I will talk you through um, some of the information that uh, I know most a lot of you are interested in, travel time, ridership, and costs. Um, so travel time is one of the key inputs that we um, consider uh, when we're looking at transit corridors and, and is one of the assumptions that goes into our ridership forecasting. Um, so I'll just give you an overview of how we um, came up with our travel times. Um, so the travel times that you'll see in a, in a second here are calculated during our peak hours. And when we calculated travel times, we made sure that uh, we accounted for the variability in traffic conditions um, and accounted for the amount of time that we would be stopping at stations, the amount of time um, the vehicles would be stopping, um, accelerating and decelerating, and then, of course, the time it would take to interline with the blue line um, on the western part of the alignment. We also take into account um, the delay uh, that's caused by stopping at signals. And we know that there are different types of traffic intersections and uh, we quantified how much delay we would expect depending on the number of cars that we see at those intersections. And then of course we uh, make assumptions on our speed limits. And as you can see here, we made an assumption of 25 miles an hour along Kellogg Boulevard and then 30 miles an hour on West 7th Street. So those are the high level assumptions. And as you can see here, our travel times hover around 44 to 45 minutes. Uh, we see greater um, or longer travel times traveling westbound. Um, so between 44 minutes and 45 minutes for options one and options two. And then in the eastbound direction, um, slightly faster travel times uh, with streetcar option one having 43 minutes and then streetcar option two having 44 minutes. And one of the main differences in the travel times, um, as Jennifer described, is really based on um, the two additional stations for op streetcar option two. So as I mentioned, travel time is one of the inputs that we use for ridership forecasting. And as you can see here in our summary table of project trips, our ridership um, for streetcar option one and streetcar option two 
um, really what we're looking, what I'd like you to focus your attention on is the 2040 estimated ridership. And as you can see for streetcar option one, we show 11,600 trips. And then for streetcar option two, that's 11,200 trips. And there's slight differences here. Um, and this ridership information is based on 2019 data, which is pre-pandemic data. And I'll explain why in a moment here. Um, but when we look at these numbers, the ridership is essentially the same. And you might ask, well, why is the ridership slightly lower on option two when we've added a couple of additional stations? And the answer for that is, while we do see additional ridership in the segment where we added the two additional stations, we lose ridership in other parts of the corridor because um, those additional stations add travel time. So it makes the trip a little bit longer. Uh, so a slight decrease in overall trips on the on the alignment. Um, but overall, when modelers look at this, and even when the FTA looks at these numbers, they would consider those numbers essentially the same. So another question that I know you might have, uh, sorry, if we could just go back for one second, is why are we using 2019 pre-pandemic data? And the answer is when we did the ridership forecasting for this uh, for the two alternatives, um, with the Metropolitan Council um, is in the process of updating their um, the regional stops model, which uh, will be using post-pandemic ridership. That uh, model is not ready at the moment. And so we do anticipate that when that uh, model is updated, that the we would have updated ridership numbers that would reflect post-pandemic conditions. Mm -hmm. Next slide. So now I'll talk a little bit about our cost assumptions. So um, for our overall capital cost assumptions, um, you can see there kind of in the middle of this in the slide uh, that we are using um, our 2023 is our base year for you know how we start developing our cost estimates. But um, the streetcar option one and streetcar option two capital costs um, are about $2.1 billion, and that is uh, in 2033 dollars. So it's, that's the year that we're assuming Riverview would be operational. And again, the numbers here are very close, very similar. And the main difference, primary difference between the two um, options is, again, the addition of the two stations for the streetcar option two. Um, I think it's important to note that our, our cost estimates for both alternatives include an elevated station at Mall of America, a new Highway 5 bridge, track work associated with both of the alternatives, uh, an operations and maintenance facility, the roadway reconstruction that is needed uh, for the alternatives, um, in addition to other bridge work. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the stations, all of the utility work that we would need, um, our systems and technology, right of way, um, any right of way that's needed, uh, the cost of vehicles, and then a 40% contingency, which is appropriate for um, a project at this level of study. So moving on to the operating cost assumptions, um, <clears throat> one of the key things that um, factors into our operating costs, of course, is how long is the travel time? And then how often and how frequent are you operating the service? And as you can see here in the table that shows our operating schedule, um, we are assuming that our frequency would be 10 minutes the majority of the day and 30 minutes um, in the late evenings and early mornings. So that's the, the foundation for how we developed our mm -hmm. operating cost estimates. Um, and you can see there at the bottom of the slide, streetcar option one having a $34 million operating cost and streetcar option two having a slightly higher cost at 34 and a half million. And again, the primary difference between the two is the, um, the additional cost of the two stations. So with that, I'll hand it over to Jennifer. Yes, and we will go through this comparison table again at the end of the presentation, but this just gives you kind of a snapshot between the two streetcar options, what's what's the same and what's different. So streetcar option number one has 20 stations. Uh, option number two has 22 stations. In terms of dedicated lanes, um, the differentiator here is really uh, between uh, auto and uh, grand. 
or Union Depot rather for option number two. So there's approximately 10.1 miles of dedicated right of way with number one and 8.2 miles of dedicated right of way with option number two. Uh, and so the point at which people share lanes with traffic occurs in St. Paul from Otto down to Union Depot for option number two. The service frequency is the same uh, at 10 minutes uh, during the daytime and then 30 minutes late night uh, and late weekend. And then travel times uh, are very, very similar. Um, as Mona had pointed out, um, westbound uh, is a little bit uh, slower than eastbound for both options. In terms of 2040 ridership, uh, it's 11,600 using 2019 data uh, for option one and 11,200 uh, for streetcar option number two. Uh, but that is using 2019 data. We will be doing new ridership forecasts and that will be using post pandemic numbers. And so we do need to uh, recognize and acknowledge that ridership across the country has went down um, for systems. Uh, it's a different it's a different world. Um, the AMPM peak is not as uh, prevalent as it once was. There are more all day trips. So just wanna acknowledge that uh, we will be working on new ridership numbers. In terms of capital cost, uh, streetcar option number one is 2.10 billion whereas streetcar option number two is 2.12 billion. And the difference being that there are two additional stations for streetcar option number two. Uh, likewise for operations and maintenance, uh, 34 million for streetcar option number one and 34.5 for option number two, once again, uh, due to the fact that we have two additional stations for option number two. So further ways to differentiate. Um, and I think we'll really be focusing on this segment here in St. Paul along West 7th, but you know, the more dedicated right of way that you have, uh, that lends itself to greater transit speed and reliability. So where you have an option that is operating in mixed traffic, there is that's a differentiator um, in the sense that you know you have to be with the existing cars and trucks. Um, and so there is that risk that you uh, wind up with less reliable service than if a uh, streetcar is in its own dedicated right of way. Um, but other ways to differentiate between these two options, and we will walk through these in detail, is balancing parking, on street parking, access to businesses, uh, and mobility needs in terms of the pedestrian realm. So, you know, being able to cross, um, what that uh, feels like for the pedestrian. So pedestrian transit access and crossing of West 7th, are you going to a center platform that's within the roadway, or are you uh, entering from the sides? Um, what are the opportunities behind the curb with each option uh, in terms of gaining uh, more space for pedestrians, more space for trees uh, and public realm? Uh, there is a difference between parking availability. Option number one uh, really limits on street parking. Option number two uh, looks to preserve or maintain that parking uh, as well as business access. So when you have dedicated right of way, as you know from if you've been on University Avenue, it's it's a different uh, environment in terms of being able to, to make a turn. It's usually a right in, right out versus being able to take a left across the guideway. And we'll, we'll show those differences uh, in a minute. And then finally, vehicle turning movements. Um, one option really limits vehicle turning movements to uh, signalized intersections, much like what University Avenue does, where you have to go to a light and then make a U-turn. Um, whereas option number two allows uh, cars and trucks to turn across the guideway at, at all intersections. Excuse me, Jennifer. Yes. Uh, Russ? Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Just a, an observation and a question on the uh, on the cost slide. Actually, one is that uh, if my math is right, 40% contingency, which I understand why uh, large contingency is required in a project like this, that would mean that the actual project estimate is closer to a billion and a half. I believe plus forty percent contingency. And you don't have to answer right away, but that's just that—that's my math anyway. Um, the second is um, a question about whether the total capital cost is, is inclusive of a full reconstruct of Seventh uh, Street. I believe it is, but it's one. Yes, it is.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> well, on the subject of the cost, is the uh, 2.1 billion, I think I heard Ms. Alabadi say that it's 2033 is when the system is up operational. Should the capital cost be at the time of uh, letting, when you let a contract, that's what the cost would be versus when the construction is done? Basically, when you receive a bid, that would be the, the capital cost. And then the other question quickly on the 34 and 34 and a half million for operation and maintenance. Does the maintenance include snow and ice control? Although like weather like today, you don't need it, but uh, does that include maintenance uh, or, or maybe it's too early to do that and it's too insignificant to worry about which, which option would be more difficult in snow removal, regardless of who owns the road? Um, with regards to the first question, Mona, would you like to go ahead and take that? Um, yes. So in terms of the question about um, the capital costs and being reflected at um, the time that you go out for bids versus the um, time that the system is operational, we do our our cost estimate actually is is quite detailed and does include um, costs for a year of expenditure. So when you'd actually be expending the funds. And so, um, we do have those numbers, but just for simplicity here, we we just chose to focus on the twenty thirty three dollars. But uh, we certainly do have that in our um, detailed cost estimate. We can provide that information if you're interested in it. Um, and then in terms of the operations and maintenance costs, that it would be reflective of maintenance, including the snow and ice um, removal and maintenance. And I'm not sure if, um, Grant, if there's anything you want to add to any of my uh, answers there. Sounds good. Thank you, Mona. All right. So with that said, I will turn it over to Jessica Lobbs, who's going to walk you through um, starting at the at the end of line down in Mall of America up through. Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry, Jennifer. Uh, Tim? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I... I wasn't sure. Do we want to hold questions till the end, or do you want to feel free to? Yeah. No, no, okay. go ahead, Tim. I'll, I'll I'll appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the the ridership estimates were are the are the estimates done uh, on an end to end estimation, or is it in, or is there uh, estimates for partial ridership? So it, it's I I don't know how common it would be to ride it end to end. I could envision, for example, mall to the airport or downtown to the airport. And so, so are there any breakdowns in terms of the ridership mm -hmm. estimates uh, in between rather than just end to end? Uh, there are. Um, I'll let Mona take that in terms of the, the nuts and bolts with that. Sure. So the numbers that you see here um, for 2040 ridership are for the um, end to end ridership for the entire corridor. Um, we do um, take a look at station boardings and, and have a good understanding of what ridership would be um, at individual stations. And we also have done um, some tests to see what would ridership be at, you know, shorter um, in shorter segments of the corridor. Um, your comment is is accurate that, you know, there are probably not many people that are riding this end to end. There's a lot of shorter trips that are happening along the corridor. Uh, but the way that we do report ridership is from an overall corridor basis. Thank you. Nice. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as Jennifer said, we're going to start at the Mall of America. Um, so the the end, one of the endpoints of the line. Wanted to get that comparison in your minds, just so you understand the quantitative end to end is fairly similar between the two. Um, but we want to provide you with some more details about the corridor, um, the whole corridor. So as a reminder, here at the end of line station at Mall of America. Um, we are proposing an elevated station that's on 82nd Street. So you see that in the orange atop there. That serves both Riverview and Blue Line. Um, this would mean that that purple or blue Blue Line track that you see going around um, that vacant parcel and into the Mall of America Transit Center would be vacated. Um, that would mean a shorter trip for Blue Line by about two minutes. Um, and again, removal of those tracks and no need to uh, maintain those tracks. It opens up that parcel for redevelopment. 
um, and also remove some of the existing traffic delays and issues at the 24th and Killebrew intersection, uh, which you see down there at the bottom left. This is a concept of what that elevated station could look like. There's further coordination and uh, conversations that would happen around this, but this shows the Riverview train. So the one car on the one side kind of from above. And then this view is from below uh, where the blue line train would come in on the other side. Moving into the Fort Snelling area, um, you see in blue, the blue line alignment going into the existing Fort Snelling station. And just beyond that is where we would move into the Riverview alignment through the Bedote Fort Snelling area and across the Highway 5 bridge. So a little bit about that interlining. Um, Riverview can be accommodated with additional track and a platform at the existing Fort Snelling station. Uh, interlining can occur with minimal disruption to the existing blue line service, uh, but that would require a change in current operating rules um, in that airport tunnel to allow two trains in the tunnel at one time. So that is a conversation that we are continuing with Metro Transit and the Metropolitan Airports Commission. We introduced this at the last meeting. Um, we are proposing to uh, move Riverview through this area, a ramp removal of the westbound Highway 62 ramp. Um, oh, I'm sorry. The ramp from westbound Highway 62 to southbound Highway 5. Um, this ramp carries about 3,000 vehicles per day, which is a lower ramp volume overall. Um, the PM peak is about 200 vehicles. We do want to note that a lot of people use this ramp to go to the airport, so about 1,600 to 2,100 vehicles per day uh, use it to access Terminal 1. Um, so this ramp removal is of concern to the MAC, to the, to the airport. Uh, this ramp removal does allow us to get the train through this area with minimal or no disruption to the native bedrock in the area, and also allows land connection to the historic fort um, and some improved bicycle and pedestrian connections. A little bit more on that in terms of mitigation considerations. Um, so we are proposing the mitigation for this ramp removal is a reroute to Highway 55 and back um, to southbound Highway 5, which does minimize the, again, bedrock, visual, and some other environmental impacts, um, which are elevated in this area because of the protections around the Mississippi River. We did look at a variety of mitigation options with our issue resolution team of various stakeholders, um, including a new flyover ramp. So just totally replacing that movement. Um, same environmental concerns and a pretty high cost for the amount of volume that would carry. Um, we are committed to investigating other potential mitigation um, and acknowledging that the project as a whole, uh, not just for this, but for for everything proposed in this area will need additional regional operating, operational modeling um, to under fully understand the regional traffic impacts. So this shows that proposed um, reroute. So if you follow the black line and arrows to go westbound on Highway 62 up to Minnehaha Avenue, and then turning around to go back east, eastbound to southbound Highway 5, that's about a two minute detour. The bridge concept, we shared this with you last time as well. Um, as Jennifer had mentioned, it's a fully uh, new bridge under either of the streetcar options uh, with an elevated deck above for pedestrian and bicycle um, to facilitate those movements and also to allow programming on the top. Um, we do see opportunities for cost sharing. Um, with that replacement bridge, but we are carrying the full cost in our cost estimates. As mentioned, it improves the existing bike and pedestrian access, ADA deficiencies in the area. You have to take your bike up the stairs um, currently to access the top. Um, opportunity for tribal and community programming on that upper deck, which was of interest to our uh, issue resolution team members. It keeps that existing tunnel intact 
So just a reminder that it, that is one of our guiding uh, principles here that we have to maintain that tunnel uh, because of the surrounding um, native lands and rock in that area. And then wanted to note that this leaves us uh, with five lanes available across the bridge. Two lanes would be dedicated to transit uh, and three lanes to traffic. So if you remember, we did talk a year or more ago, there we go, um, about a single lane option. Uh, Metro Transit had some concerns about that. Not sure what's going on. Um, so we looked at some other options and wanted to talk a little bit about that. So use of lanes across the Highway 5 bridge. We have three lanes available to traffic, so we can either have two lanes going toward St. Paul and one toward the airport, or two lanes toward the airport and one toward St. Paul. Um, the two lanes toward the airport uh, is what we are proposing right now, but want to acknowledge that our partners at the MAC have concerns about that and would prefer two lanes toward the airport. Uh, we did do high level traffic impact analysis here. There are minimal differences between the options, but again, a much more robust regional modeling effort uh, would be done uh, if streetcar options do move forward. Uh, our partners at MnDOT outlined uh, a number of safety issues with option one, which would just have the one lane toward St. Paul. Um, because of this configuration and entering the tunnel. So um, tunnel being in here, that um, there are concerns with some of the merges and the speeds at which traffic would be traveling here. Uh, merges would be very challenging. Um, the geometry is challenging in this area. Uh, and also trying to stay within that footprint, again, disturbing as much of the surrounding landscape as possible. Excuse me, Jessica, I have a question. Um, I have a question about the bridge concept slot that shows um, a steel box starter for the deck. Has there been a feasibility study done on other materials? Um, and, and is the cost estimate based on the materials shown in this, this concept? Yes, so we did look at a variety of bridge options um, and would have a, a, there is a report available uh, that we can make available to you um, with that. This is this is where we landed. Um, this is what is reflected in the cost estimate. Uh, but we can certainly, you know, that will continue to evolve if this this option does move forward. Thank you. Go ahead. At the last pack, there was a lot of interest in transition points. So you'll see that uh, reflected in this presentation today. But this shows that Highway 5 bridge crossing in the red are the transit lanes. So on the upstream side, the yellow are the traffic lanes. Um, as we transition onto West 7th, this would require a reconfiguration of the ramp loop here. Um, currently, what we and we're continuing these conversations with the city of St. Paul. Um, looking at a transition to center running here. Uh, this would require a signal to be placed at that ramp. Um, and then on West 7th, uh, up to a certain point, this would be center running dedicated in that Southern or Western portion of West 7th. And this is just an, a reflection of what uh, Riverview may look like at a Dra Davern Street station, again, on that um, lower portion of West 7th. It's the same between both streetcar options. So station in the middle with trains running in the middle there. Before we get into West 7th. Yeah. Excuse me, go ahead, Tyler. So you mentioned that one of the reasons why we're not doing this is because Metro Transit had concerns about reliability, which I very much share with anything that has less than 100 dedicated right away. I think that's frankly one of the main downsides of streetcar option number two is that there's even less dedicated right away on more on the But I wonder if you, there's been conversations with Metro Transit about what that does to the part of the line that is interlined from the blue line and whether there are some logistical challenges for just the scheduling purposes um, when they love that much unpredictability at the early part of the line. Yes, I think that is a concern of of. Metro Transit as well. We'll talk a little bit about that as we get into the 
portions of West 7th that are different or have a little more mixed traffic. Um, but uh, I think everyone is very interested in keeping Blue Line whole uh, as much as possible. And that has been a priority that's been expressed to us. So we will continue to work through that. Okay. okay, we'll get into the portion of West 7th Street then where we see um, the most differences between the options. There are a number of slides here, but feel free again to ask questions at any time. The comparison again, so Jennifer walked through these, so I won't spend a lot of time, but streetcar option one has all dedicated lanes in the center, all the way up to Grand Avenue. Uh, in option two, around the auto, um, station or just beyond, beyond it near Victoria to Grand is mixed traffic. So you see that represented in the solid pink line there. Um, that is side running in that section and two additional stations at Jefferson and Smith. Transition points again. So this is for option one. Uh, the transition point would be at Grand Avenue again. So in the red here, the dedicated center running lanes station here at Grand, and then through the intersection is how we would transition to um, the mixed traffic lanes heading to Kellogg. Couple of views of this section for option one, again, Grand Avenue Station in the center. You can see the one lane of traffic on the side. For option two, transition point at Victoria. So just beyond the auto station, again, at a signalized intersection, we would move from the middle dedicated to the yellow side running mixed traffic. And you can see here, we've uh, maintained some of that parking in blue. Typical section, so kind of side by side here, Option one, again, at a station, this reflects Randolph, uh, station in the middle in option one with uh, trains running in dedicated lanes on either side and a lane of traffic on either side. For option two, median in the middle, the yellow represents a shared lane, so trains and vehicles would share this lane with access to the station on the side. Excuse me, Jessica, Russ? Yeah. I just wanted to point out, um, we talked about this in the last week, one of, one of the concerns that we have about some of these street sections. Russ, excuse me, could you use the mic? This, this is a big room. <laughs> of course. Um, so uh, just to reiterate, we talked about this a little bit the last meeting, but one of the concerns that we have about some of the street sections and option one in particular are the sidewalk widths. And so if you look at the option one here, particularly on the right side of the diagram, I can't exactly read what that width is, but I can tell that it's less than 10 feet and, and pretty narrow. Yeah. Um, and, and and the option two, there's a, there's a bit more space to work with. And so that is one of the dynamics that we're just thinking about and, and tracking very closely. Thank you. It's another uh, photo simulation here for streetcar option one at Randolph. So again, center running station. Uh, this is one of those areas too, where you can see with that, uh, with the tracks in the middle, this would be a ride in or a ride out only uh, movement, no movement across the tracks for vehicles. Option two, Jefferson, um, you can see here, the uh, train heading toward the river. And then here you see a vehicle traveling in the transit lane toward St. Paul. And then away from the station in some of those mid-block sections, um, this is approximately Victoria to Forbes. So option one, again, with the trains in the center and the travel lanes on the side. Um, and the big difference here uh, is with option two is a presence of a left turning lane uh, as well as parking uh, maintained on the sides next to the shared train traffic lane. Okay. 
is so you have Smith, again, just kind of a depiction of what that looks like for cars traveling in the side running transit lane. Excuse me, Jessica, what are the numbers in terms of the parking? We will get to that, okay. Mr. Chair, okay. very soon. Uh, Jennifer went through this, but again, just a reminder, and some of these have you could see in the cross sections, but we'll go through some specific side-by-side -side images here mm. on other ways to differentiate. So transit speed and reliability, and then balancing some of those other things like parking, vehicle and pedestrian access, uh, and how people move through this area, uh, including the opportunities for green space. So we'll start with the speed and reliability. So you heard Mona say that we do account for uh, some of the variability in mixed traffic in our travel time uh, estimations, uh, but there are things that can't be modeled or situations that could happen, and those are more likely to happen uh, in a, a situation like option two, um, where we could have a block in the track, or we could have a, a vehicle that's parked a little askew and blocking the track, causing delays. Um, those are things that can be managed with good enforcement and some other design things, but that is a risk to reliability. Um, option two with a little more mixed traffic operation is also just sensitive to, a little more sensitive to traffic congestion. Crossing distance. So the difference here between options one and two uh, are that with option one with the streetcar in the center, there are longer crossing distances for pedestrians and they must cross traffic lanes to access the stations in the middle. Um, there would also not be marked crosswalks at unsignalized intersections for safety reasons. So pedestrians would only be allowed to cross at signalized intersections. In option two, there's a little more permeability, um, shorter crossing distances, opportunity for um, people to access the station directly from the curb, as you saw in those cross sections, and some more opportunities for curb extensions and space behind the curb. Tyler? Sorry, can you see longer crossing distances? I mean, that is technically true, right? But it also, there's the island in the middle of that, the actual crossing is across the front of the park um, well, yes, you can have a pedestrian refuge in the middle, um, but you are um, limited to only doing that at signalized. So where there are stations, am I saying this correctly, Grant? Um, presumably you'd be going to a station and that would be your destination. But um, yes, you are correct. There could be a, a median refuge. Yeah, I'll have to green line, right? I mean, there's plenty of cross there right now and they're not... A fair point. Chai? Yeah, Mr. Chair. Uh, two questions. The first one is what is the process for the track to support the redesign of the river bridge and tunnel? Uh, and what is the, the uh, path to agreement between the MAC and the Metro Transit? Uh, there. Sure. So backing up to the Fort Snelling section, um, first question about tribal engagement. So uh, we have four tribes that are part of our issue resolution team for the Bedote Fort Snelling area. So leading up or talking through all these options, they were involved in that. We also have had separate meetings with just the tribes um, throughout the process. So what we have in that area and the bridge reflects their input to date and they will continue to be involved if streetcar moves forward with the design and what that bridge looks like as well as the national park service and the minnesota dnr um, the mississippi river all through minneapolis and st paul is uh, protected basically is a national park uh, and has some other visual and um, other considerations that would be required um, to for what that bridge looks like and how it functions. Did I answer your first question? Um, and the second question was the path to uh, achieving uh, a path forward on the tunnel operations, right? Right. 
allowing two, not just one. Um, so yes, we've been having some of those conversations with Metro Transit, um, MAC, Fire Life Safety. Um, so I think everyone is aware of what we would like to do. Uh, there would be some changes necessary to the tunnel to allow that and have appropriate ventilation and those kinds of things. Um, but we're continuing those conversations. Go ahead. <clears throat> Since you backed up to the yeah. bridge talk, uh, being a being an engineer, I've been trying to figure yeah, out know. the three lanes of highway and okay, this two way. transit. This Was one. there ever a conversation or, or thought about um, splitting the uh, transit lanes and then make them share it with the roadway? Where so you will have two lanes of highway on one direction, three lanes the other and then plus you'll have your two transit lanes or is that something you'll talk about later when and if we pick a we did look at mixed traffic operations um and sort of splitting one dedicated one mixed um as options it was a while ago uh anything you want to add about that grant just how we landed here what i didn't like about the slide it says minda doesn't like this one and Mac doesn't like the other one that puts us in a position and there's always a solution that we can all be partially happy. So. So initially with the concept of two dedicated lanes and three traffic, one of the things we looked at was um, directional flow. Is it in the morning? Is it heavier southbound versus northbound? And, and is there a way to split traffic that way? And what we learned was pretty much all day long, it's bi-directional. It's very even, evenly split across the bridge. So the northbound and southbound across Highway 5 is equal. So that was one of the things we looked at. The second thing we looked at was um, mixed traffic lanes and the transitions. Um, the, the, the challenge with that is how do you get off of Highway 5? It had We had to introduce a traffic signal on the south side of the bridge um, at Fort Snelling. And that was equally um, problematic for MnDOT and how that would work and how people and drivers would react to it. And so we um, went back to the dedicated lanes as preferred, and that's where we're at right now. Thank you. Any other questions on the bridge? Okay, we'll continue with West 7th. Uh, I think we covered this cross crossing distances. Boulevard and green space. Um, option one, not a lot of space available um, with the right of way that we need or the space that we need to accommodate the two lanes in the center. So we're looking for green here uh, on these images. So you can see in option two, we have a little bit more opportunity for boulevard space um, and snow storage and opportunities um, to separate pedestrians uh, from the roadway and parking a little bit more. And this is a big one, parking. Option one, there is very limited opportunity to keep on street parking. And apologies, this kind of went off the line here but we're only able to keep about 35 spaces uh, with option one. With option two, we're able to keep a lot, most of the on-street parking, uh, again, in blue. Um, that leaves about 400 spaces on West 7th. So that is one of the biggest uh, differentiating factors between the two. Access, so this is Speaking about vehicles specifically here, uh, option one, uh, much like pedestrians, limits through traffic uh, across the corridor. So if we're not at a signalized intersection, cars cannot go through. So they will have to do a right, right in or right out movement. Um, left turns are limited to only signals. And then with option two, again, some of that same, a little more permeability can go across tracks um, to access side streets 
and can also make left turns. So that is the comparison of the West 7th portion where there are some of the more uh, differentiating elements. So before we move to downtown St. Paul, any questions I would take Mr. Chair at this time? Russ? Mr. Chair, thank you. M more of an additional comment. I really appreciate the um, the detail on kind of the, the differences. And I think it does highlight some of those differences that in option one, uh, the city was pretty uncomfortable with in terms of those trade-offs. Understanding that we do have trade-offs to make here between the speed and reliability of the regional transit trip that's trying to get, you know, a, a reasonable distance and a reasonable amount of time. Um, but that street section in option one in this section is just, it, it's not a West 7th that any of us would recognize. Um, and we don't think it will function very well for people trying to walk along the street for people trying to cross the street. I didn't mention earlier about the less than 10 foot sidewalk on, on the one side anyway, the issue of snow storage. Um, it's it, there, there are places where it would really be inadequate from a pedestrian perspective in that option. I'm not saying that option two is like the, the, the ideal Nirvana um, situation uh, necessarily for a street section either, but it, but it is a lot better in terms of that local context. Again, in thinking about how we balance that that local context with the need for a decent um, regional trip as well. And I think that really summarizes sort of the the complexity of this corridor. How do we make how do we make a good regional transit connection? And how do we do it in a way that keeps very local communities along the way, and, and especially this section along West Seventh and St. Paul? A community that people can recognize, want to invest in, want to um, want want to be a part of. So I, I just really appreciate the the detailed work here. I feel like I need to maybe say a counterpoint just just because I and mean, it's from the record here, but I I have deep concerns about street cars for number two for all the things that I've sort of previewed here. Um, I've talked to a lot of transit advocates over the last. About a couple of months, less it has become clear that we're this is a decision we're going to be making, and people are deeply concerned about the continued erosion of dedicated right of way to this line. Um, frankly, I think a lot of folks would like to see a, a line that has 100 percent dedicated right of way, but now we're going to continue to whittle it down, whittle it down. Um, and there's a lot of unpredictability in the line in option two. Um, I'm thinking a lot about workers who are trying to get to work on time um, and the unpredictability that option two is introducing into their lives. Um, I, you know, I, this, we need to be thinking about the future, uh, 30, 40 years in advance, um, and getting as many writers on this line as possible. Um, uh, and, uh, I, I have deep concerns that this number two is going to introduce some unpredictability, um, to the logistical problem, um, that is going to, uh, make this a really hard sell. And we're going to have to go to the public and sell a $2 billion street car. Um, I think it's really important to get the details right. Uh, so that's Any other comments? Pat? Uh, maybe this is a little too early in the presentation, but I sat and read through this the last two weeks and now going through it here and nowhere in this whole presentation, does it address construction concerns for any of the options as far as what the process is uh, as it relates to closing or demoing West 7th Street as far as time concerns? Uh, and maybe we're kicking that can down the road, but if we plan on presenting these options to the public in order for transparency, I think it would be very important to uh, highlight the impact that the construction would have. So we know uh, as far as how it's going to affect the community and uh, businesses along not only West 7th, but, you know, the whole corridor. So again, I don't know if this was something that we just aren't talking about right now, but I highly recommend that there should be some estimations as far as impact uh, when it comes to construction. Great point. Uh, 
Having lived through the green line, I that's a big one. Jessica, you want to give that a shot? Yeah. I mean, we need to look at what is the mitigation, how we're going to deal with the. Right. And you're absolutely right. I mean, construction is a very big uh, concern for business owners. And we know that. Uh, and that's a very good point. If we are taking what I think right now, we're just we want the opinion of this group on what we should take to the public. We haven't talked a lot about construction because we have different options. There's a bus option we'll be talking about next month. Um, but regardless of where we end up, uh, we can have some of that information before we go to the public, some estimations. So if I hear you correctly, once we decide what we're going to do on the corridor, I think it's a fair point when we go to the public that we talk, then we need to come up with what are going to be the impacts and potential mitigations. Yeah, I think we can give general terms at this point. And a pro or you know some general parameters of how long that construction would be, what types of things would be involved in that. Um, but could could we list remedies to these things? We don't have to be specific, but we should have some sense of remedies. Yes, I think we have some other lessons learned from other projects and uh, things that are in the toolbox for different agents. <laughs> Bill? Mr. Chairman, just to build on that, I, I my assumption, and correct me if it's wrong, is that whether it's rail or bus, either one is going to have a complete re reconstruction of 7th Street. So we're going to be demoing and redoing the street in either option. Is that right? The bus may not. Okay. And we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, next month, but the streetcar, yes. Yeah, it would be great if there was just some some way to look at it before. Well, yeah, and I, I totally agree with you, Pat. Again, having lived through the green line, and so has Russ <laughs> lived through the green line, uh, there are a lot of lessons we've learned that we know we're not going to repeat. Uh, but to your point, we need to be transparent and bring those forward and say, here are some of the remedies, you know, uh, Definitely and we'll address those. We'll... That can be the most impactful time for businesses. Russ? While it is true that the bus option wouldn't necessarily require a full reconstruction, I think the underlying infrastructure would say that at some point the street needs to be reconstructed. Exactly. And that as long as we're out there doing significant work, it's probably the right time to get it done. That's right. A little quicker, so we'll keep moving here. Um, so in downtown, uh, we are assuming mixed traffic operations on Kellogg. Um, for the purposes of comparison here, option one is center running, option two is side running. So when you see the numbers and travel time and things that we've shared, it reflects those um, operations on Kellogg, but um, would just say that there is a lot more to be done on Kellogg or to be understood on Kellogg. So we could end up uh, perhaps having, you know, if we end up center running on West 7th, we could be side running on Kellogg or vice versa. We can mix them in a little bit depending on the lens of Kellogg. Um, and that's speaking to some of the other things that are happening uh, on that piece of roadway, including the Capital City Bikeway Project that the city is currently doing. Um, some of the bridge work that's already planned or that would need to be done as part of this. Kellogg is a series of bridges. Um, so these can all influence each other, but this is the alignment um, which connects West 7th to Lower Town and serves Union Depot. And these are a couple depictions of center running and then side on the next slide for the Minnesota Street Station. So here is the center running and then the side here, you see the tracks at the curb. And then just a quick word about how we would move into Union Depot. So with the center running portion, um, again, the station is on Kellogg and then we would serve, or I'm sorry, the tail track uh, storage would be in this parking area. 
and it's very similar with the side running, except it is side running, um, but same storage area. But again, serving off of Kellogg Boulevard. That's pretty much it for the alignment. Any questions about downtown specifically? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll turn it over to Jennifer for the comparison. All right, so with, with all of that extra context, this is the table I showed you before that kind of compares it by the numbers, but there's a lot of trade-offs here with these two different options um, that aren't necessarily uh, quantitative, they're qualitative. Um, and so, you know, with that said, um, in terms of, of cost, travel time, ridership, they're very, very similar. Uh, but the, the differentiator really is in the operations of it, whether it's center running and side running, um, the two additional stations, um, and the preservation of on-street parking is a major differentiator. So just want to call that out for folks. <clears throat> and I can pause if there's any questions about this or discussion. Um, Jai? Yeah. How do these two street options compare to the bus route 54? So the question is, how would these uh, compare to bus route 54, which is the existing service out there today? Um, I think in terms of, and we do have those travel times, correct? Um, Mona, would you like to take this? The question was about travel times? The question was, how do these two options compare to the existing Route 54 that operates today? Oh, yes. So um, in terms of travel times for the Route 54, if we're looking at um, peak period, because that's the travel, when we develop travel times for these two options, we assumed peak periods. Um, the Route 54 um, travel time can be uh, about 43 minutes during the peaks. And so the um, streetcar options are pretty close, slightly longer than the Route 54 today. All right. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Okay. So this is a table that shows kind of the summary of those qualitative differentiators. Uh, streetcar option one has more dedicated uh, lanes for uh, more reliable transit service. Streetcar option number two has a little bit less uh, dedicated lanes and more shared use. Um, and so as a result, there is the risk of uh, running into uh, delays in service if there is something ob obstructing the tracks. Um, in terms of summary, uh, our streetcar option number one, a uh, little bit longer pedestrian crossings or different feeling for pedestrian crossings um, if you're going to access the service from the center of the right of way versus from the curb, which a portion of streetcar option number two uh, allows for. Um, streetcar option number two does allow for uh, bump outs and, and medians at stations um, as opposed to uh, option number one, which would be in the center of the right of way. Um, and so I've already covered like where pedestrians cross to. So the station for option number one would be in the center of the street versus um, for option number two, which would be a combination of center of the street. And then for the segment that is side running, um, folks would access uh, from the curb. Uh, streetcar option number one, um, there wouldn't be any conflict with existing trees that are out there today and the catenary wires that would um, be installed, but it doesn't provide as much space um, for the boulevard. So there's a trade-off there with option number one. Um, however, with option number two, um, there could be more potential conflicts uh, with the catenary wires um, and trees. So you know, that's something to, to weigh in terms of visual impact um, and impact on that boulevard space. Um, for streetcar option number one, left turns and through movements to the uh, other side of West 7th would only be allowed at signalized intersections, forcing right in and right out turns um, in other areas. So that is a major uh, distinction for option number one. Whereas for option number two, um, it would not be uh, prohibitive for for vehicles to be able to cross uh, to make a left turn lane. Um, 
movement, they would be able to do that at all intersections, uh, not both signalized and non-signalized. So option number one, it does offer some challenges in terms of delivery uh, and loading operations to businesses. Um, but that being said, you know, streetcar option number two also offers some challenges, uh, but there is some possibility uh, in utilizing um, what is now the existing on-street parking uh, as a potential loading zone. So we might have a little bit more flexibility there with option number two as we continue to refine the design should the policy advisory committee choose to go that way. Route. And the big one, uh, option number one, um, it does take away quite a bit of on-street parking that's out there today. Uh, streetcar option number two preserves most of that on-street parking. So that is a, a big differentiator. It's a little bit of a, a, a quantitative and a qualitative uh, measure in and of itself. <clears throat> so I'll pause there. Yes, question. Excuse me. No, not really. All right. Yep. yep. Um, you're talking about tree impacts in terms of the ability for trees to be successful in the space available. Uh, what are the impacts to mature trees for both the options? And then for the trees that, that are being newly planted, um, what are the increased costs associated with reduced surface space to allow the, the new trees to be successful? Yeah, so the question um, was around how does it affect uh, mature trees that are out there today, each option, as well as the planting of new trees and what space could be allowed um, to make sure that those are successful. So um, with option number one, uh, <clears throat> because the catenary wires would be in the center, um, there would be less impact most likely from that perspective with option number one, but because of the construction of this, there could be impacts to mature trees that are out there today. So it's a little bit of a, a mixed bag, I would say. Uh, for option number two, uh, we could have some challenges with the existing mature trees and the catenary wires that would be on the sides with option number two in the shared side running uh, segment of that option. However, uh, option number two does allow for a little bit more space in the boulevard. So that would help with any new trees um, that would be planted as part of that. So it's a little bit of a, of a gray area and it, we'd have to probably go block by block to make sure that as we put things in that we're not uh, conflicting. So follow up to that then would be, are, are you looking at engineered soils for those trees that you'd be bringing in to uh, support their growth, despite the fact they don't have the surface area that a typical tree would have for success? Um, and are you looking at, at other green infrastructure uh, methodologies for supporting trees that potentially could water them better than a more standard, just dealing with the direct runoff from a sidewalk? methodology for right. watering. Um, so we're not at that point yet of level of detail. Okay. I mean, that would be something that we would definitely be tackling in a later phase, especially probably through the environmental phase, which we are not yet in. Um, so that would be a consideration depending on whether the PAC wants to move forward with a streetcar and which option they want to move forward with. Uh, that would be something that we would definitely be looking at. Thank you. Bridget. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hello, everyone. Um, in our working groups, we've talked about the uh, traffic that would get deferred in uh, to other locations when we talk about one lane versus two lanes in the directions. And as you know, we're uh, concerned about that. Is that information that the PAC is going to get Mid, is that information that the public will have access to? That to me is a, it's a piece of information that I think comes into play when we're weighing options. Uh, we do have a report for that piece of information. We're happy to forward that to the PAC. Um, we also uh, are happy to make that available to the general public. Um, this is all part of the analysis that we've done. And so um, we would be posting that on our Riverview Corridor website, um, but we will get you that information to the PAC specifically. Thank 
All right. So I'd like to call Kevin Gallantin up here for the Community Advisory Committee update. Welcome, Kevin. Good morning, uh, Kevin Gallatin. I'm the co-chair of the Community Advisory Committee. Uh, the committee just met this past Monday. I saw the same presentation you did with a similar time frame in terms of ability to kind of comment and, and digest the information. So it's a little, little fresh. Um, we had seven committee members and two community at-large members participate. Positive meeting, I think, um, lots of insightful questions and comments. Um, it was very nice to see the plans and renderings advance quite a bit. It's a lot easier to understand the scenarios and think about the implications when you can see that much detail. Um, I think a general theme that the committee brought up was concerns around the, the overall cost estimate and the extended timeline of the project planning phase. I think there's a desire to get some of these benefits to the West 7th area um, sooner rather than later. Um, river crossing uh, discussed changes in the lane configuration, um, as many of you brought up today. Uh, it is very challenging geometry. There's some concerns around vehicle backup potential um, and safety concerns related to that. Um, those, those exit ramps um, terminated into travel lanes really quickly there. Um, in terms of right of way, um, hindrance from private vehicles is uh, a concern that was brought up uh, repeatedly. Um, you know, the, the travel times between option and one, one and option two of the streetcar um, are surprisingly similar, um, uh, given the, the pretty big differences in um, the potential for hindrance of private vehicles. Uh, there was some discussion of trade-offs from potential um, intersection closures at smaller streets. Um, closing some of those intersections, whether option one or, or option two primarily, um, could reduce travel times. That was one of the conceptual um, ideas. Um, and then the restriction of pedestrian crossings with the center running alignment um, was a tough one, I think, for the committee to, um, to, to digest. Um, around parking, unsurprisingly, um, drastic reduction in on-street parking for businesses is a concern. Um, committee members suggested assessing parking availability beyond West 7th um, proper, so looking at adjacent side streets, um, so that you can understand, you know, a drop in 300, can you quantify that in, in a percentage basis of parking in the whole um, travel shed? Uh, and then uh, around truck access for unloading and uh, loading for the many small businesses is a concern too, so they wanted to um, encourage the project team to evaluate that as well. Uh, any questions uh, uh, from the CAC? All right, thank you. Well, thank you. And please uh, express our thank you to the committee. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> All right, so next steps. So our next Policy Advisory Committee is February 29th. It's a Thursday from 1 to 2.30. And at this meeting, we will be delving into the details of the bus option. We'll be comparing the streetcar options to the bus option, and we'll be presenting uh, the outcomes of the economic impact analysis that looks at the impact of streetcar and bus on West 7th through downtown. So that will be the February meeting. And at that meeting, we will also ask for the policy advisory committee to make a decision on whether you feel comfortable going out with options to the public, whether that means one streetcar option and one bus or two streetcar options and one bus. Um, we will be asking for the PAC to take an action at that meeting. So it'll be very important to have you all in person for that to be able to have that action happen. Um, if you all do feel comfortable um, with that option and, and want to move forward, um, then we would start a series of public engagement spring all the way through the summer. And then we would come back and reconvene the policy advisory committee in the fall uh, to tell you what we've learned, what the public thinks about the options, um, and then to get your direction in terms of where do we move forward from here? Uh, do we continue moving forward with planning for a streetcar or do we decide to um, take on a bus? That will be the decision point for that. So that will be in fall. And I'll just pause there to see if there are any questions about kind of the next steps before us. All right. So with that, we have a public comment period, and I will turn it over to my colleague uh, to 
call folks up to make public comment. I think it would be best oh, um, just you, to be able to make sure we, we capture people's uh, thoughts. If you can come up to the podium to make your comment, that would be great. And excuse me, Jennifer, no. uh, Tim. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and, and thank you. I'm, I'm looking forward to the public comment. Would like very much to, to hear the public input on, on this. But I, I, I kind of wanted to at least lay on the table a, a comment that you made earlier, Mr. Chair, uh, about the scars that you and Russ have from the Green Line construction. And I know uh, Bridget also the construction of the Blue oh, Line. That's right, Bridget. <laughs> no, uh, so has... and, and actually, uh, in addition to my work in Bloomington, the seven years that I worked at the University of Minnesota, the, right. the 20 years I worked at the University of Minnesota, seven of them were on the you Green were Line on as it came through campus. That's when I met you. The, exactly, <laughs> that's right. Uh, and that, it all kind of brings up the fact that when we worked on originally on the Blue Line and then on the Green Line, we were learning a lot of things and a lot of these questions were new. But a lot of what we've talked about today, we have some real world examples here in the Twin Cities about these questions that have been asked, whether it's the impacts of construction that have been brought up or the tree canopy or the uh, the river crossing issues or parking. All of those issues have been brought up in the past and, and there've been that discussion. So we have a body of information and a body of practical knowledge right now that we can apply to a lot of these questions as well. In addition to things that we haven't talked about here, but we know are going to come up, things like pedestrian safety, vibrations, electromagnetic in, uh, in uh, messes, uh, you know, the business impact, the the unforeseen circumstances on, on campus as we came through on Washington Avenue, digging up the old streetcar lines and, and having to deal with the old timbers and rails from, I mean, that unforeseen kind of things. It It's uh, the impact of large venues, large uh, uh, stadiums and venues on, on the line. It all kind of plays into it, but we have examples here already that we're dealing with or have dealt with in the past. And so I think as we move forward and as we look at some of these questions and as we search for answers, we've got we, we've got examples locally. And this isn't what they did in Denver and this isn't what they did in St. Louis. This is what we've done in the Twin Cities about how we've dealt with some of these. So I just wanted to bring that up and, and kind of provide that perspective because there are folks here involved with this. I know the folks working on this have, have been through the, the, you know, in the trenches as well. And I just wanted to make sure that we keep those perspectives in mind as we continue to move forward and try and find answers to some of these questions. Excellent comments, Tim. Thank you. I should have said that. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Jennifer. So, Kevin, I'll... All right, thank you. We do have five comments from the public. If you've filled out a card, I invite you to please come kind of up to this corner over here and kind of queue up. I'll uh, I'll call your names and we'll invite you to come to the podium. You can speak to the committee uh, right from the podium so we hear all your comments and your comments. First, uh, all right, thank you. All right, first I'd like to call up Katie and read your comment, please. Good morning, my name is Katie Nicholson and I'm a resident of St. Paul's Highland Park neighborhood. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to thank everyone holding the meeting and your work on this project, as well as the opportunity to speak before you today. I think that the Riverview corridor should be considered for two car light rail with a fully dedicated right of way instead of a streetcar or arterial bus rapid transit. I am a regular rider of the Metro A line uh, our region's first arterial bus rapid transit uh, pro. There's a lot to like about the A-Line. I much prefer um, riding it to most local buses for its stop spacing, off-board fare payment, shelters with heating. Uh, but the big caveat with um, arterial bus rapid transit uh, often is the lack of dedicated lanes, uh, which is incredibly important for maintaining uh, reliability and speed. If the West 7th Corridor is to be considered a future backbone of our transit system, especially with the City of St. Paul's plans for redevelopment within the corridor, we need to address capacity and travel time from the start. And the best way to do this is by having fully dedicated light rail, uh, especially if it is to interline with the blue line. You can look at the 85% dedicated lanes and you think that does sound pretty good, but that 15% is on what is consistently the most congested part of West 7th, directly northeast of Grand Avenue. I understand that there are parking concerns if a dedicated right-of-way uh, is considered uh, for the entire corridor. However, um, there are about, uh, yeah, in the uh, corridor that's not dedicated, 
there are um, about 16 parking lots and parking ramps nearby. And if parking is to be removed, having rail in its place is a great benefit to residents and businesses, especially on game days during uh, home wild games. Uh, and I think that we can explore options to make up for the lost parking, whether that's additional ramps uh, or lots, uh, preferably ramps to uh, keep it more contained. And I'd like to see a public engagement period with the public that could explore more a fully dedicated um, right of way with light rail. Uh, and I think we should also be able to see for ourselves the data on uh, how light rail would operate with, you know, um, the increase in, or sorry, the decrease in travel time, the additional capacity, uh, as considering that there will be future redevelopment, not just directly in this corridor, but uh, beyond where, you know, there's the purple potential purple line. Right now we have the gold line in construction and people are going to uh, transfer from these lines. So I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm really concerned with, um, you know, not having fully 100% dedicated lanes, really concerned with um, not being able to have that additional capacity. Uh, I appreciate the work, though, in, uh, you know, our current options, and I thank you all for your time. Thank you. Okay, our next public comment from Tim. Good morning. Good morning. So first of all, I want to say thank you again, um, as Katie mentioned, to all the staff that have put a lot of work into doing this and for y'all to keeping Riverview alive and making sure that we're still making progress on this. Um, I think the first thing that jumps out a lot of people is the price tag. And while it is high, a train is still worth it if we give it the priority it needs. Option one is the better option here, but it's not the best rail alternative that we can do. First, um, while the crossing distance are larger for pedestrians, crossing 84 feet of car lanes and dedicated train lanes is not the same as just crossing 84 feet of car lanes. Um, trains stay on the track, they're highly visible, they have a loud bell, and they don't run red lights, unlike cars, which can do a lot of very unpredictable things. Um, also, as Russ mentioned, the sidewalks would be narrower, but it would only really need to be narrower for a small stretch right next to the station, because that's where the choke point is. We may be able to also widen the sidewalks if we reduce lane widths from 13 feet as shown there to 11 or 12, which have worked well in Minneapolis, and we could look at wider sidewalks. As far as green space not being a lower, uh, not having as much on option one, uh, if we have dedicated lanes, we can use green track for the trains as seen in European light rail and streetcar systems. This would reduce the urban heat island effect. And... Um, even though option two adds two stations and increases access, the models show less ridership. So adding stations close to other ones loses more riders than it gains. And this speed matters because we may have to be looking at how are we gonna get our ridership numbers up to qualify for federal funding or higher amount of federal funding. Mm -hmm. And understand that we're not building transits faster than driving, but 44 minutes of end to end time is really disappointing when the Route 54 timetable uh, during peak periods is shown to be 41 minutes, not 43 minutes. And while it doesn't necessarily stop at Terminal 2 or Fort Snelling, it's still a worse experience for most riders along that corridor when we're spending a lot of money to make a better experience for them. To combat this, we need a curve that separates cars and trains as seen on the Green Line. Unlike Riverview, which will see trains limited to 30 miles an hour on 7th Street, the Green Line University can go 35 miles an hour as it crosses through an intersection and 45 miles an hour in between these intersections. What would the travel time projections of that be or the ridership projections of that be? And I think the public deserves to see that so they can really give a real opinion on what these trade-offs are and what the best rail option really is. Instead, option two is making this worse by adding 90 seconds, be 90 seconds slower than option one. Um, I do have a point of contention on how we arrived at those numbers. So our dwell time for light rail is around 30 seconds, and we're adding two stations in this, and that doesn't include acceleration or deceleration time. So are we saying that 1.9 miles of non-dedicated lanes is only costing 15, 20 seconds? I kind of really struggle to see how that's the case, especially when we're considering if this is modeling at peak periods, that's times where there's going to be higher traffic and we're thinking about event traffic. Um, Dedicated lanes throughout the entire quarter is a necessity, and neither option is currently providing for this. There's no need for two lanes in each direction on 7th and Kellogg, 
because look at East 7th between Mounds and Arcade. That is going to have a 4-3 conversion, and it has 2,000 more cars per day than West 7th in this stretch. If that's fine for East 7th, why is it a problem for West 7th? Um, also, MnDOT recommends 4-3 conversions when traffic counts are less than 20,000, which would mean one lane in each direction. All but two blocks of this route meet that threshold. And even there, they say it's not a hard stop on that number. If it's a little bit more, it's still worth considering to see what we can do to reduce lanes on that. We need to respect the public that we are asking to engage with this project by presenting them with all the options and the best options, but not including any options with dedicated lanes. We're not showing that best real alternative. And if we can't do that, we really need to question why we're spending $2.1 billion on this project. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tim. Our next uh, commenter is Jay. Good morning. I'm Jay Severance. I, uh, I'm a member of uh, Citizen Advocates for Regional Transit. Um, over the years, uh, and I happen to think uh, this is one of the first times I've had to uh, speak to this group since 2017, I think. And uh, it's good to be back into a person-to-person -person format. Uh, there's just a couple of things that I want to say. Uh, one thing that stood out to me in the comparison between option one and option two is that there wasn't any data about which, or let's say experience, as to which option is safer. Now, that takes a number of, you know, uh, different dimensions, but nothing that was said about vehicular safety. And, uh, you know, my, I don't have ex experience in this, but my impression is that uh, the um, option two with the opportunity for uh, cars and pedestrians to be crossing the tracks uh, at non-signalized, or excuse me, yes, at non-signalized opportunities, or even at signalized opportunities that there's, it seems like there's a lot more opportunity for accidents. Uh, I've asked in the uh, CAC meeting, I did ask that the team uh, look at uh, experience. You know, uh, I don't know that we've got a lot of experience on an option two environment uh, here in the cities. Uh, we do have experience on the uh, an option one dedicated right of way which I believe was probably safe. But I, I really think this is a major determination in choosing these options. Uh, the other issue is, uh, I'll take another kick at the cat on this. Uh, after looking at the bridges and the approaches and the uh, modifications or eliminations of access uh, to Route 5, uh, I just cannot see that in 2040 or 2033, whenever this uh, option might be, or the uh, uh, you know the corridor might be uh, actually done, I cannot see that a three-lane bridge is going to satisfy uh, vehicular traffic without a lot of problems, and. I've said this before, and you know I understand that the team has been, you know, concentrating on the route of the LPA. Uh, I still think there should be an opportunity to, to look at a way to get across the river that does not affect the Highway Five bridge. Uh, I know that's probably not going to happen, but uh, it would eliminate a lot of the questions that I think are in front of us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Our next comment is from Meg. Um, I'm Meg Doerr. I'm with the West 7th Fort Road Federation, which is the district council that represents the West 7th neighborhood. Um, thank you, committee members, for your work and the team that put together the outreach materials and um, all the local government staff who are here working on this project. Um, we've appreciated the engagement that we get. Um, so we, as an organization, were you know, eagerly awaiting more of the specifications and predictions to look at the bus rapid transit. So 
we're not really taking an official position at this point or any time in the foreseeable future. But um, I just want to start with a couple, I guess, cautionary things I would share from like what I hear with my ongoing, my organization's ongoing engagement with the neighborhood. Um, and before that, one thing about the trees, I, I really appreciate that tree discussion. Um, this is a huge issue across the whole city, obviously, but on West 7th in particular, um, it's a high speed corridor. We have a lot of issues with pedestrian safety. Um, and it's all, it's a very challenging place to um, to try to cross right now with walking or biking. Um, and there's there's a concern about tree preservation. I think we should remember that most of the trees on West 7th are already gone. Um, MnDOT was well ahead of schedule. We're moving the ash trees and decided to cut them rather than treat the trees so we could have some shade while we wait another 10 years until the Riverview Corridor project is in place. So no need to worry about existing trees. Um, but the fact that we ha might have reduced space for trees to live in the future is a big concern because we're already dealing with a treeless landscape. And then 10 years from now, when this project is in place, it's gonna be another 20 years until we actually have shade restored if those trees are successful. So setting that aside, um, kind of from a personal standpoint here, um, it's almost 50 degrees on January 31st. So I fully get the urgency of the climate crisis and why we need drastic solutions. Um, I accept that I'm behind it, but um, seeing the these ridership projections and the travel time stacked against the cost and the impacts to the neighborhood are frankly stomach churning. And it's hard to um, hard to think about how we're gonna try to justify that to the community. There's already strong resistance to the concept of light rail. And I understand among transit professionals, there are differences between light rail and streetcar, but from the resident perspective, if all of the alternatives include loss of trees, no bike lanes, reduced pedestrian crossings, reduced parking, and we're seeing basically travel time and maybe even reduced ridership compared to the existing bike lane plus $2 billion, that's a really hard sell. So, <laughs> Um, the community is already very skeptical about light rail and a lot of the kind of just the actual on the ground experience and operational elements seem a lot like right rail. So we're going to have a lot of work ahead of us to explain those trade-offs. 